Pi. We work with organizations very regularly in terms of helping them develop their strategy. And it's now coming up to that time of year when good organizations that want to set down a really good process for their strategy design are starting to think about it. So what we're going to do now is we're going to share five essentials that we share with all of our clients so that before they actually start the strategy process, they're approaching it in the right way to make sure that their decision making is really effective. So before we get started, it's just really important to show that many strategies don't achieve their objectives. So some really interesting research by McKinsey's found that of these mid-level profitable firms here, only 8% of firms, their profits actually increased on the back of their strategy. So again, it just shows that, you know, 78% of organizations, there was no change in their uh, profitability based on their strategy. And in fact, 14% went down. So the, the probability is, is that your, your strategy won't have the impact you think it will. Some really interesting research also done is they found that 30% of employees receive no information on how to execute the strategy. So it often just stays as a, just a, a really nicely written plan that's very elegant and well written, but really never gets operationalized. Also, that 70% of not successful transformations and strategies were actually planned by 10 or fewer people. So organizations aren't leveraging the collective IQ of their people. They're not getting enough input from people and then therefore not getting enough buy in for the strategy to be actually implemented successfully. And a really scary statistic is that 7% of employees actually understand the business strategy and what is expected of them. So 93% of employees don't understand their strategy in sufficient detail to execute it. And then finally, 58% of organizations do strategy top down with limited involvement employees. And the decision making research just really shows that that lack of participatory, can never say it, participatory decision making actually leads to less quality outcomes. So Often what happens with most strategies, this they look like this. It's called a hockey stick. So what it predicts is that, you know, well, in this year or this period, we're going to invest in new technology or a switch to this product or whatever we're going to do. And so the you know, basically profits will go down the short term and then the magic will happen. Um, and then all of a sudden it's going to go at a 45 degree angle. And often what you see in organizations is they try this. It doesn't work. So then the time goes along and they predict again another hockey stick and another hockey stick. And it eventually comes up with a graph that's called a hairy back. <laughs> so uh, a very descriptive way of describing it. So what are the five essentials of strategy that we share with organizations that you, if you build into your process, are really going to increase the probability of success? Well, number one is entropy. Number two is built versus emergent strategy. Number three is integrating innovation. Number four is the social side of strategy. And number five is enterprise thinking. So what we're going to do now is we're going to unpack each one of those independently um, and give you a little bit more detail so you can start to think about it in your own organization. So number one is entropy. Um, I am, I do admit, a little bit of a physics geek. And I do often think that the laws of physics just apply really well into organizations. So what is entropy? So entropy basically is the second law of thermodynamics. It's just one of those irrefutable laws that happens in nature. And that is that basically things start ordered. Then over time, it's just as a, a naturally occurring process. Things become disordered. So if you think about an organization, it starts as a it begins life as a startup, as an idea, as a vision. And it's very simple. And over time, things get added to it. New products, new projects are launched, new uh, initiatives are started. And then over time, things become more and more disordered. And so the original thing gets lost. So what happens is, is that organizations are very bad at finishing things. So often when they're addressed by a problem, they'll add things, but they never subtract things. And that's why organizations often become disordered. So if I look around your own organization, you'll see lots of zombie projects or big transformations that started, but they never get ended. So it's really important for a leadership team to take a step back and think, what do we need to clear up first before we get started? So you can really apply it to human social behavior. Um, so look around you and think about what do we clear up? What do we need to clarify? What do we need to end as well? Um, another thing is just on a sidebar note, never tell your kids about entropy because they will actually use it against you. So before you get started with your strategy, clean out the weeds and the debris. Think about all the entropy that's actually taken place and undo it and clear up all the weeds and debris that are in your um, everyday organizational garden. 
The next thing to think about is an idea by Henry Mintzberg, which is just a really powerful um, school of thinking, which is about built versus emergent strategy. So traditional strategy is what we call built strategy. So we design it, we articulate it, we articulate it in a document and then we roll it out. And then emergent strategy is basically where we're actually responding on the front line or we're making situated judgments um, in everyday life, everyday organizational life. And that can often take the organization in different directions. So all of a sudden, a new customer demand comes through or a new piece of regulation or a new opportunity that happens before. And all of a sudden, even though we've got this built strategy that sets out the direction, the emergent strategy over um, rules it and we go off in a different direction. And that's how organizations become what they become. So we've built strategy. It's really important when you're doing it to have a blend between both and acknowledge the importance of emergent strategy. And they can actually be intensely useful because it gives you the flexibility. And if we think about the last three years or so, a lot of stuff has happened. You know, COVID, the way in which we work has changed. And then with the current uh, problems and challenges with um, high inflation and geopolitics and that as well, it's highly likely that more stuff will happen. So when you're designing your uh, strategy, it's making sure that we actually build flexibility flexibility into our plans and we actually think about the various scenarios that might happen and so we're really clear on the strategic intention that we have to do these particular things no matter what the emergent opportunities but we also have the ability to adapt and we review and we reflect and we course correct because essentially at its very core a strategy is a hypothesis about the future it's our belief based on our analysis about what we want the future to become and so a strategic document is about how do we stack the odds of probability in our favor that it will be that hypothesis and that we'll be able to realize it. So just to sort of show you the power of emergent strategy, um, Henry Mintzberg talks about IKEA as an example. Um, and IKEA is often held as by business schools as a, a great example of corporate strategy in action. And if you think about IKEA, there's probably two things that stand out besides uh, the meatballs and hot dogs at the end in your customer experience that stand out for that really make it different to other organizations. And that's number one is that the furniture is unassembled. So what they do is they delegate labor costs to you to actually put the furniture together. And also the last thing you do before the till is you actually go into the warehouse and rather than organizations like um, Argos where you give them a ticket and they go and pick the stock, you have to go and pick your own stock. And again, it's a huge cost saving for them and enormous saving in logistics. How did they come up with this idea? You know, was it a senior team doing research on customer insight and they found these things? It's actually emergent strategy and it's just from uh, frontline people just trying to cope in their daily life without any inclination towards what the strategy is. So with the unassembled furniture, what happened is a worker was just trying to get a table into his car and couldn't do it. And so he took the legs off. And then that idea was picked up at regional level and then eventually became sort of corporate global policy. And then with the given customers access to the warehouse, um, what happened is that a store was just inundated with customers and they couldn't handle it. So the staff actually just said, open the doors up to the, start, the customers and said, look, pick your own stock and take it to the till. And what happened is, again, that got picked up at regional level and then became corporate global policy. So it just really shows the interplay between emergent and built strategy. So rather than uh, something that needs to be controlled, it's just built or nothing or we're just we're at the mercy of what happens. It's making sure we manage that tension. The next thing is um, innovation versus the performance engine. So there's one kind of truth about organizations, and that's that they're designed um, to be performance engines. We like consistency. We like stability. We like to be able to forecast. We like to be able to know exactly how much we can produce or what service levels we, we will achieve or how much we will sell. And so what happens is, is that our operations day to day are really focused on the customers that we've got now, creating things like efficiency and accountability to make sure there's follow through, that we do things on budget, that things are on time and things are profitable so that we can just things become more certain and more predictable. But what a strategy does is it doesn't necessarily focus on the BAU. What it does, it actually focuses on innovating and bringing new things in. And that brings it into direct conflict with the organization. So if you think about how innovation is introduced, that comes in through a strategy. So it could be new product, new technology, new segment, whatever it is. It has to integrate 
with a performance engine that's doing thousands of revolutions per minute and you've got to feed it in. So how does that happen? Well, it creates a bit of a tension. So you've got the functional leader that's running the performance engine and then you've got the innovation or project leader that's got maybe their dedicated team and they're trying to introduce something that's uncertain. There's no guarantee that it will work and it's non-routine. And so they have to often pull upon the resources of shared staff. They've got to, you know, the function leader's got to deploy their people and their resources to make something that's actually going to make them more inefficient and less likely to hit their um, near-term target in order to do something that might not even work in the long term. So the strategy has to set real clear priorities and how people are expected to reprioritize based on the strategy and the intent behind it as well. And if you don't make it clear in the strategy with your leaders, then they will have to work it out themselves. And the functional leader will nine times out of 10 win because they can always just point to you'll impact our targets, you'll impact our existing profits and that as well. The fourth thing we get organizations to think about is the soft side of strategy. And this has a huge impact on the strategic planning process, like how it actually becomes what it becomes and the decisions that we make. So one of those things that's really rife in um, the decision making process is cognitive bias. Um, we talk about this all of the time and that there are basically 186 cognitive biases and they afflict individuals and teams in all sorts of different ways. So we're just going to pull out just a, a few of the main ones that you're likely to be impacted by that you need to be mindful of. Now, biases can't be eliminated. We, we just have them. But what we can do is we can notice them and challenge them and put checks in place to make sure or build more diversity around us to make sure it's not just our perspective that's built in. So one of the most rife ones is overconfidence bias. So overconfidence bias afflicts about 80% of us um, over our life. And the way in which it plays out is that when we make a strategic plan, we just we just underestimate. We don't think about previous experiences or the experiences of other organizations where they've tried to implement something different. And so we think about the goal and we set it and we set ambitious timelines because I think we want to push people. But we don't really understand or incorporate or we willfully blind about operational reality. And so what happens, that's why our strategies often fail or drift or we just never get to the end of it. And so what can we do to make sure that we're not um, prone to overconfidence bias? So one powerful thing you can do is a pre-mortem. So when you're setting your goal, think about all the things that could possibly happen and try and mitigate for them or adjust your plans accordingly or atomize it, your plan down more so you can actually have more milestones and adjust accordingly. Um, another thing that's really effective when the team are actually talking about strategic plans is introducing the idea of probability or even Bayesian thinking. Um, so with probability, it's like um, when people are really passionate about an idea or people are quite dominant, then they'll often present their ideas or their initiatives with great certainty. And so other people will think, well, who am I to challenge that idea? Because you sound so certain and you're an expert in your area. But if you ask the person to actually say, well, what's the probability of it succeeding? And you ask them to put a percentage number against it. Very rarely will they say 100. If they do say 100, maybe there's something wrong with that because nothing is certain as a, in a complex adaptive system. So if they say it's 80% probability, then what it does, it allows the group to talk about the 20% of probability that it won't work. And so therefore, you can actually adjust your plan or you can mitigate for it accordingly. Another one is authority bias. And again, this really plays out where we sort of we defer to the highest uh, paid person in the room, uh, the hippo. And so when they come up with an idea or initiative that maybe should be challenged a lot more, um, we just fall in line because that person has reward power over us or, you know, we go against our better judgment because the dynamics are that everyone else is agreeing. And so the authority bias kicks in and, and often leads to things like group think as well. Um, another thing that plays a great part in the strategic plan and process that we need to pay attention to is intuition. Um, just hear it all the time. You know, it's gut feel and, you know, really trust our instincts. Um, and intuition does play a part and it should play a part in the strategic planning process. But it's just being mindful about putting some boundaries around it. So um, the research shows the way in which intuition works is it's pattern recognition. So we our neurons fire up and we're constantly searching for pattern matching 
against our past experience. So if you feel that something's happened, we get this intuitive feel that happens that's quite physiological that shows us that, that this will work. And that's just our brain's way of doing it. Now, if we're an expert and we've done something like this before, then we can actually trust our intuition a lot more. But if we haven't done it before, and often strategy is new, it's something we haven't done before. Or even if we have done it, something similar, the context might be different or, you know, it might involve different people. So we can't trust our intuition quite so much. So Daniel Kahneman, who wrote the book Thinking Fast and Slow and won a Nobel Prize around this kind of um, lifetimes research that he's done, came up with an idea around disciplined intuition. So he's saying do apply it, but apply it at the end. So when you've done your analysis and you've developed your options and you've narrowed it down, then apply your intuition and use it as a data point. But don't use it as the only data point when you're making your decisions. And then finally, think about applying an enterprise mindset. So this is really important, is often overlooked as well. So um, many managers and even CEOs specialize in one particular area and then they're promoted into a senior leadership position. And so what happens is we see the world through that lens. And you'll often see a CEO that maybe was promoted from marketing or from HR or from sales or whatever it is. And they'll often just defer to that particular way. And therefore, they don't have an appreciation of all the different disciplines. Or you have sort of senior leaders or managers that are just more biased towards their particular area. So with um, strategy is you need to look at things through an organization lens. You need to think about it through the organization's goals. And you really need to think about the decisions that you're making and, and on the impact of the whole organization. So you need to look upstream and downstream from where the decisions actually being made. Um, and you really need to be thinking about when you're working a strategy, if you're trying to solve a particular um, problem, is that you're actually identifying the root cause and not a symptom. The other thing to think about as well is when you're doing a strategic initiative is think about the mutual dependencies. So it's about understanding the logic of the system and that there's a logic about why it is the way it is. Um, so understanding if I change this organization's a system, so what will it change over there? And that's why it's really important and why it's really important to expand your decision making group, that you're inclusive and you bring in people that will be impacted by the decisions to make sure that that they bring their perspective in. You don't necessarily have to act on it, but it's just more perspective that you can bring to make sure you make a rounded decision. Um, and also really make sure you understand the needs and the priorities of other areas. So strategies often create conflicting priorities. So it's like we want to do this, but we want to do that. We want to be efficient, but we want to be innovative. Well, you can't really do both with the same amount of effort. So you need to make sure that you're not creating priorities that are going to bring into conflict that your managers then have to work through on the ground. And that's really inefficient and makes their life much more difficult. You need to create clarity. And then the last thing to leave you with is about organizational tensions. Now, all organizations have tensions and your organization will have its own unique tensions. So it's really important to understand that your strategy has to navigate those things. So just to give you an example. So in an organization, when you're developing a strategy, you have to navigate the short term. You've still got to deliver on the number. You're still a going concern. You've got to cover your costs. You've got to hit your investors or shareholders expectations. But you also have to build into the, the long term. So you can over service the short term at the expense of not developing new product or new technology or whatever for the long term. So you've got to balance it, but be aware of the trade offs that you're making. You've got to be aware of the balance between the employee needs and the commercial needs. If you've got a high level of ambition in your plans, what will be the impact on employees? What will that growth mean to them? What are the key roles that are going to be impacted here? Where do we need to add more capacity and more capability to make sure that we can achieve it? And also of winning sales and resourcing the sales. So again, if you're really focused on growth, that you've got the resources, you're, you're speaking to the people that are actually going to do the work and that they're resourced and that they've got that capability and they're feeding into it. Or at least they're aware that's what you're considering and they can say, look, these are the things that we'll need to improve. And these are some of the timings that you might want to think about. And if you want to bring that online, then that's a peak time for us. So could we sort of with the strategy just change the timings a little bit? So it just means that people it, it, it flows much more and people are having to force things through the system.
And then, you know, even other things were, you know, being really clear in the strategy in terms of, you know, how much are we going to standardize things so we can scale it and how much are we actually going to be allow things to be personalized um, and built around the needs of the clients. And again, the strategy sets out the policy. It doesn't set out the nitty gritty, but it's like the policy that you want the people to follow. And that therefore allows them to actually then go and execute it, apply it in their area. So think about the final thought for you guys is what tensions do you have to navigate in your organization? You know, obviously you'd be balancing the long term and short term. So it's just thinking through what are the things that you need to do? So if you bear these five things in mind, um, we do this a lot. So if you've got any further questions in terms of what we've shared with you, um, we're always sharing new tips about delegation, strategy, setting decision making criteria, optimizing your strategy process um, please leave your thoughts in the comments below and also share your tips as well and if you're watching this on youtube then please subscribe to the channel we're always adding new videos regularly almost every week um, in terms of new tips so if you're a modern progressive manager and you're really looking forward to putting in um, new ways which are more inclusive into your organization then please subscribe to our channels